I the a-hole for telling my parents I would not care for my obese brother? When my little brother Teddy was born, his umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck. According to my mom, he wasn't breathing for at least three minutes. Since then, my parents often used that as an excuse for Teddy's behavior. My childhood became a living hell with Teddy. Give Teddy your candy, he died coming to this world. Let him play with your friends, he died coming to this world. Let him open your presents, Teddy almost didn't have a birthday. He had to put up with Teddy's tantrums, mistreatment, fits, and bad behavior. If I touched a single hair on his head, I got punished, while Teddy got away with whatever he did. It became so bad that when I was 15, I moved out the house to live with family members away from Teddy, and my contact with my parents and Teddy's limited. Currently, I'm 35 and Teddy's 26. When he was 18, he decided he wanted to be a competitive eater, which turned into just eating. And now Teddy weighs almost 600 pounds. Because of his weight, he can't hold a job and lives with our parents, who still cater to him and pay for everything. Since Teddy requires round-the-clock care, my parents hardly leave the house. They weren't present at my wedding, only see the grandkids if I bring them around, and all family events like dinners have to held at their house because it's hard to move Teddy. A few days ago, Teddy suffered a bad fall that put him in the hospital. My husband and I at least came to see him. My parents complained that the hospital wasn't feeding him enough, didn't have a wheelchair big enough for him, but naturally they didn't want to hear anything about his weight. It would be easier to turn water into gold. To make long story short, my parents pulled my husband and I aside and asked large amounts of money for Teddy's care. They said that they didn't have money to keep caring for him and were having to dip into their retirement funds. They even suggested that once Teddy's cleared to go home, he moved in with us because my husband and I are well off with a bigger house and so we can get a break because we have to care for him all year round while you just visit. I said no. My husband told them hell no. We both work full time and our kids are enrolled in sports and dance. We made it clear that Teddy would not be moving in with us, nor we would be moving our schedule around to deal with him or giving them the money even though we could afford it. But he is your brother. You almost didn't have a brother. We left the hospital. My mom later called me, berating me for abandoning the family and Teddy and demanding money. I told her I would not care for Teddy under any circumstances. Even if something happened to her and my dad, I would not care for my brother. It is her problem, not mine. My mom cursed me out over the phone and hung up. I do feel a little bad because Teddy's my brother, but he made my life hell and my parents refused to take any responsibility for his behavior. Am I the a-hole? Now for the top comments. Not the a-hole. He can't hold a job and lives with our parents who still cater to him and pay for everything. They enabled him to get to 600 pounds. He's not much longer for this world. These are based on his decisions, which we're not responsible for. They need serious family therapy to see how their behavior is leading to the death of their son. They can't just help him get close to death, then pawn the problem off on someone else. They aren't going to have Teddy around for long if he stays at 600 pounds. They are killing their own kid with food. The parents will most likely outlive Teddy. Plus, it's like every 600 plus pound live TV show ever. Teddy physically cannot maintain his weight with his little flying monkeys. This is totally on appearance. The Opie will get blamed for his early death too. Not today, home. I feel bad for you and Teddy. You were both failed by your parents. Right? There's nine years between the two. That means it was a six-year-old that was so horrible their 15-year-old sibling had to move out. And that wasn't a wake-up call? That's what stuck out to me too. They created such a monster of a child in only six years that they ran off their 15-year-old. Absolute insanity. And yet, even with this recent interaction at the hospital, the mom is still trying to use the fact that Teddy almost died at birth as a manipulation tool. I feel so bad for OP. And Teddy too. He never had a chance. Not today, home. What the heck is wrong with your parents? They're helping that umbilical cord finish the job. Next story. Am I the a-hole for having another child after giving my first up for adoption? When I was 17, I got pregnant with my first child. I was in a very unstable, toxic environment. Was to be a single mother. I had no family support. I was told to get an abortion by close members, but I didn't. I thought I could handle being a mom. I was wrong. I struggled hard with everything from work to childcare to bonding, and it felt like I was causing my baby to suffer along with me. I had PPD, the severe anger portion, and didn't know it. I was drowning and failing at every turn I took. So when my baby was three months, I decided to let her dad's aunt and uncle legally adopt her. 
They've never shut me out. But I was beyond guilty and disgusted with myself that I have minimal interaction with my baby. I felt she was better off without me. Fast forward 10 years. By some miracle, I have found a love of my life, and we're doing well. We've discussed my baby and the effects it had on me over the years. He's always wanted a kid, but I've been hesitant because I vividly remember failing so miserably. He's assured me everything will be fine. Still, it scares me so I've stayed on birth control, and sometimes this extra percussion will use rubbers. A couple of months ago, I missed my period. Didn't think much of it, but took a test anyway. I usually do I feel anything is off. Lo and behold, I'm pregnant. My husband is ecstatic while I'm freaking out. He tells me my circumstances are different, but I've grown as a person, so things would be okay if I had another child. When we told our families, his side was happy, but mine freaked out. They told me I was already a horrible mom. Why on earth would I have another kid to be horrible too? That I would do nothing but cause pain and eventually give this one up too. I feel terrible about having another kid because I'm terrified. It'll be the same, but I'll fold again. Plus, how am I going to explain to this kid they have a sibling mommy couldn't take care of? I don't know what to do. Am I the a-hole for having this kid? Not the a-hole. Who you are as a single mom at 17 is not who you are at 27 with a partner. Don't let your family, who didn't support you at 17, drag you down. Being a parent is overwhelming, but you are different. That said, don't let your husband talk you into a kid you don't want. If you want a kid, now it with him. Go for it. Not day hall, but your family, all of them saying anything, are. You're a teenager, having a child, alone with PPD. I was in my 20s, married with an awesome support system, and barely made it through because of PPD. My husband and his family got me through, along with therapy. You didn't fail as a mother, you didn't fail your first child. You did what you have to do to save your own life and your child's. You saved both of you. Not to cause her freak out, but ever hear those horrible news stories where mom drives her and kids off the bridge in a family minivan? PPD. While it's not always that serious, it easily can be. 1. Relax. Take a deep breath. Steady yourself and make a plan now. 2. Your family has got to go. They didn't support you then. They're not supporting you now. No contact, at minimum for the duration of pregnancy at a good chunk, if not all, of baby's first year. That will be the hardest for you. You do not need any outside negativity at this time. Not one little bit. The time right now is for you to focus on you and your child only. 3. Treatment and therapy is necessary. You've already had PPD. Don't wait for it to happen again. Start now. Take it very seriously. It will help immensely. 4. Your husband and his family. Lean on them and lean on them hard. They're there for you. So use that to your advantage. You are not alone. You have them. Talk with your husband, let him know about the PPD then, how serious it can become, and let him know you're afraid and in need of help. Possibly set up something with his family with alternating weeks between people to assist when you become later term and for a while after the baby is born. PPD can last a long time, 3 to 24 months after the baby is born. Even if it's just lunch dates with someone, anything with help. All the positive support you can get, suck that up. 5. Your first child. How do I explain to this kid they have a sibling mommy couldn't take care of? Easily tell the truth, age appropriate of course. There is your reason your first child should be kept a secret. You don't need to take out an advertisement or anything about it. But if asked when they're young, just say, mommy was too young. I didn't know daddy then and was unable to care for a baby by myself then. If they do not ask, do not not tell them. Let them know they have a half sibling and let them know why. It could also be a great opening for us to talk with a teen. Teenage pregnancy is so very hard to go through. Mommy was not able to. I learned a hard way to use protection always. 6. You got this. Edit 1. I want to humbly, I can't express just how humbly, and sincerely thank everyone for their advice. I'm in tears reading these responses because other than my husband, who is the sweetest, most supportive person I've ever met, I've never had anyone tell me it wasn't wrong to go to the adoption route. I will be turning to therapy to try to help with these feelings and doubts. I will also be cutting off my family. They've contributed to a lot of my issues in life, and I will not allow that energy around this new baby. Next story. Am I the a-hole for not calling out my son for treating my daughter badly? I have two kids, a son Ben, 44, and a daughter Emma, 42, female. But their father and I divorced when they were young. He wasn't a good husband, but he isn't a bad man. 
He is wealthy. He didn't bond with Emma, but he favored Ben, and it became overt as they grew up. Ben was easier than Emma and did well in school and sports. Emma, although smart, wasn't interested in school and was rebellious as a teenager. Their father spoiled Ben, and if I'm honest, he wasn't nice to Emma. If this upset her and she would cry, feeling unfairly treated. I felt bad, but I couldn't do anything about it. So I felt it better to pretend it wasn't happening and hope it got better. It didn't. He wanted nothing to do with her, although there wasn't a reason why. Emma struggled to cope with this, and I think expected me to stand up for her. But I hate confrontation, and her father never listens to me anyway. I preferred not to discuss it with Emma and focus on other things. But she said I didn't allow her to be upset and didn't validate her. I didn't want to potentially cause a bigger rift and cause Ben to side with his father. Ben, on the other hand, was lavished with anything he wanted. Money, cars. He was expected to be successful like his father. As adults, the relationship between Ben and Emma fizzled out, which was sad because I couldn't do anything about it. Despite being given a large amount of wealth and more opportunities than most, Ben hasn't become successful. He is quite resentful about it. His father stopped giving him money a few years ago, and he partially blames me because I told his father that he had given him too much. Despite being an easy child, Ben has grown up to be rather difficult. He has a temper and is very sensitive about his lack of career success, so we aren't allowed to talk about it. Emma's a stay-at-home mom. She's a good mom and her children's father earns a lot of money. Her father was regretful, so he reconnected with her. They have a relationship now. It's quite superficial, but I think it healed a wound a bit for Emma, so she reached out to Ben. They got along well for a couple years, but Ben stopped speaking to Emma. Emma was upset, and think it's because Ben doesn't like their father's interest in her. Ben hasn't given her an explanation, but he told me a silly reason that doesn't make sense. I told Emma I think Ben has behaved very badly. She asked me if I told him that. I said no, and she shouted at me that I have never stuck up for her or protected her. And if I can't do it this one time, she doesn't want a relationship with me. That I enable this behavior at her expense, and she's sick and tired of it. The thing is, Emma has three kids, and Ben has one kid. Emma will still allow me to have a good relationship with her kids, but Ben has made it difficult for me to see his kid at the past when he's angry. So I'm afraid he will do that again and stop speaking to me. I also don't want to be forced to be in the middle of them, so I won't do it. Am I the a-hole? Now for the judgment. You're the a-hole, and so weak. I feel for Emma. Absolutely spineless. That was my first reaction reading this. How can you be so spineless? OP, you're the a-hole. Those are your kids. You're supposed to protect them and support them. And all you did was let them both down. Shame on you. Because as long as Emma was the target of her father and brother's mistreatment, then OP wasn't. What an absolute awful human being. Because I refuse to even call her a mother. You're the a-hole for being a total failure as a mother to your daughter. You allowed this behavior by not sticking up for her. So what if you hate confrontation? Does that give you a right to emotionally abandon your daughter and be a silent accomplice to her torment? You are terrible. And if I were her, I'd never speak to you again. Since you just want to suck up to your son for the sake of being grandma. I hope Emma cuts you all out of her life. You've all failed her. Exactly this. You're the a-hole OP and you have failed both of your children for your own comfort. Pretty soon both of them will go no contact with you. And you won't have to worry about any of it. I felt bad but couldn't do anything about it, so I thought it'd be better to pretend nothing was happening. You failed your kids. You failed them by letting them be treated so wrongly. Parents like you why adult kids go no contact. Shame on you. Yes, that makes no sense. Even if she couldn't change the way the father was being, talking to her daughter, giving her more emotional support, etc., would have been useful. Instead, she just acted like nothing was happening. Now for the last story. Am I the a-hole for saying that someone old enough for social media is old enough to know Santa does not exist? The other day in Facebook, I made a post about how it's my first Christmas as a grandma this year, and I'm excited to play Santa again as my son and his girlfriend live with me, so I'll be helping them assemble toys, wrap gifts, etc. They asked me to. My nephew is 12 years old and has a Facebook account, and had added me as a friend a while ago. He never posts, so I forgot we were even friends. A few hours later, I get a text from my sister saying I ruined Christmas. And why did I have to post about Santa? I was confused, and she said her son still believed in Santa until he read my post. She demanded I apologize to him and tell him I was joking. I told her no. This isn't the five-year-old who accidentally overheard. And even then, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable lying. He is almost a teenager. 
who honestly should have known by now. If he's old enough for a Facebook account, he's old enough to know Santa doesn't exist. This has caused a bit of controversy, and I do feel bad that I ruined magic for my nephew. Am I the a-hole? There is no way a 12-year-old these days still believes in Santa. Your sister is deluding herself about that. It didn't true anything. She's in denial that her baby is growing up. Not stay home. Homeschooled, maybe? It's not hard at all to believe a kid with an overprotective mother wouldn't know about Santa. My kids are 8 and 10, and are homeschooled and know Santa's not real. I have friends with school children who believe at 12. These are parents who let them watch what I frankly feel is inappropriate things, and they still believed. However, if your child is on social media and shouldn't be till 13, then you need to be prepared for adult things. Not day hall OP. Not day hall and yes, if she's still protecting his belief that Santa's real, he's clearly not mature enough to have an online social media profile. No, mom is clearly not mature enough, being angry that her 12-year-old son found out about Santa. It's not the kid's fault that he has a dumb, overprotective mother. It's nice when preteens maintain some innocence, but if he is on the internet and social media, then how have they kept it from him for so long? I feel like they've used Santa to keep him in line and as a discipline tactic. Also, I think Santa is toxic AF, and I'm still not sure my young children are going to be brought up on him. I know what you mean about toxic. We do care to never refer to naughty slash nice, hold presents hostage or base gifts on behavior. We also refuted some of the weird songs about him watching you all the time to determine if you are good or bad, because that's just plain weird. I think you can keep the tradition and the fun without weaponizing it. 